Okay, well, about everything you need to know about the railroad is visible in the slide. It's a moldy deck. You can see both decks there. Um, it's a steam arrow railroad. It's a flatlands prairie railroading. Um, you're looking at Indiana on the lower deck and Illinois on the upper deck. We'll talk about uh, the limitations of multi deck railroading and flatlands railroading um, and uh, some of the opportunities as well. Uh, I grew up in uh, Iowa and we moved to Indiana when I was a little kid and uh, ran into the nickel plate by accident. The nickel plate is uh, Shown on this map, this is the Greater Nickel Plate. It started at the upper right in Buffalo, New York, and went to Chicago at the upper left. And in 1922-23, they acquired a couple of lines in Indiana and Ohio and, and Illinois, the Lake Erie and Western, and the old Cloverleaf, which uh, gave them access to Peoria, St. Louis, and Toledo, and Sandusky. And then in Ohio in 1949, they leased the Wheeling Lake Erie, the Iron Cross, which gave them access to uh, the coal fields down around Zanesville and Wheeling, Ohio. The red arrows show the extent of the railroad that I've modeled, which was part of the St. Louis line. The two big arrows are the division points, Frankfurt, Indiana on the right, and uh, Charleston, Illinois on the left. I modeled both division points. The small arrows below the line are all of the towns I've modeled. And as we talk about timetable and train order operation briefly, um, you'll notice that there's a lot of places there, a lot of towns where trains can meet and pass. And that's very important part of uh, timetable and train order operation. What my goal was essentially was to build a time machine. When I was a kid, I grew up in a town right on the Illinois state line named Cayuga, Indiana. And uh, that's about all I got to see of the uh, St. Louis division. Didn't have a car, my dad wasn't a rail fan. Um, so my theory was that if I built Cayuga accurately and it looked like Cayuga and it took me back in time, then if I built the rest of the railroad equally accurately um, it would be, in a sense, uh, time travel because I could go back and see scenes like this little vermilion viaduct and uh, it would be a, literally a form of time travel and uh, it actually worked pretty well that way. This is my hometown of Cayuga. This is where the Chicago and East Illinois line from Chicago down to Evansville, Indiana, crossed the nickel plated grade. Um, I used to go down at night or even during the day in the summer to this interlocking tower that was there and a guy named Bill Schwab was there in the daytime and his daughter was our first babysitter when we came from Iowa to Indiana. Um, the depot was kind of a forbidding place but Mr. Mitchell was the nickel plate agent. His daughter Sally was a classmate the uh, only thing that's left in this picture is the Fable House Hotel is still standing and the way in the background is the uh, post office. Um, so thank goodness I was there and got pictures at the time. Uh, this was all very active. We uh, kind of got spoiled uh, with people like John Allen and Alan McClellan. We, we kind of came up with the idea that uh, if there aren't any mountains, um, we weren't really model railroading and I got to admit I had the Allegheny Midland and I, I love the Appalachians, I love the Rocky Mountains, um, but there's a beauty to the Midwest and uh, the flat fields and uh, the farms, there's an elegance to them that you don't see in the mountains and there's a different type of railroading and I think this scene makes my case reasonably well that uh, there's no reason not to model the Midwest, but it takes a different approach to model railroading. When I first started editing model railroad planning on the first issue in 1995, I created a term for something we've been doing all the time. Well, anytime a prototype model build a model railroad accurately, 
uh, he or she was actually modeling real places. And I, I labeled those layout design elements just to have a handle. And that sketch at the top is a drawing I made of Linden, Indiana, with the, where the Monon crossed the nickel plate. And there was a warehouse and an L-shaped depot and an L-shaped freight house and a lumber yard and a shingle mill part of the lumber yard. So when I actually got around to building uh, the model of Linden, the freight house isn't in this picture, it's, it's there now. Uh, it's, it's not any coincidence that the, the picture resembles the drawing because both of them are actually based on the prototype. So prototype modeling is pretty easy. You just follow the blueprint. Um, there's not gonna be a quiz, but uh, this is a, a drawing of the uh, nickel plate. Uh, it was in December 2014 MR. It'll be in next year's Great Model Railroads 2022. If you look at the left-hand drawing, that shows you about all you need to know. On the far left side of the left-hand drawing is a hidden staging yard. And it, it feeds along the bottom of the drawing and then up the right-hand side of the drawing into a mile-long model of Frankfurt Yard, the engine terminal in the yard. And as you leave the, the yard westbound along the top of the drawing, you just simply go around the peninsula the first time and you wind up at the top center of the drawing. Now we move to the middle drawing and you just do the same thing again. You go around the room a second time and around the peninsula and you wind up at the third drawing on the right and you wind up kind of where you started on the third deck uh, above the original staging yard. You're now gone all the way from Frankfort, Indiana, across the state line to Charleston, Illinois. And right behind where my head is, is the uh, staging for the uh, other half of the St. Louis line. So we've gone from uh, everywhere east of Frankfort, Indiana, that right-hand arrow on that map I showed you. We've gone over the third subdivision of the St. Louis line. Um, all the way to Charleston, Illinois, which is at uh, right above my head in the drawing. And then everything from Charleston East West to St. Louis is right behind my head in the staging yard. Very simple plan. This is Frankfurt, the main hub of the nickel plate. In uh, this part of uh, Indiana, there's two main hubs. One of them is here in Frankfurt, the other one's in Bellevue, Ohio. If you went to Frankfurt today, you could still see the coal dock at the upper left behind the smoke, it's still standing. On the right is Kemp's uh, Sunray tomato juice plant, it's still standing, it's a different company. If you have an old scale reefer from Atlas that says Kemp's Sunray tomato juice, it says Frankfurt, Indiana, that's the plant. You can see a double headed nickel plate Burke train leaving town here for Bellevue, Ohio and then on to Cleveland and uh, Buffalo, uh, they didn't need double-headed Burks for power. They're just balancing the power. They needed more power to the east. This is the engine terminal in Frankfurt, and this shows the sweet spot of modeling. Um, you can see two Berkshires on the left, but if you squint kind of hard and look by the coal dock, you can see an RS3, and if you look under the coal dock in the distance, you can see two RS3s. I've always liked RS3s, and they were delivered in April 1954. Uh, steam ended on the St. Louis division in the summer of 1955. So if you want to model the grain rush in the fall, which is a real busy time, it makes sense to model the fall of 1954, because by the fall of 1955, steam was gone on the St. Louis division. So that's how you pick an era. You just kind of make a chart of all the neat things and draw a line down and pretty soon you start eliminating everything. And then uh, this is a picture of my version of that same scene uh, on my model. Now, truth be told up there in all that blue sky, because it's a multi-deck model railroad, you'd actually see the upper deck, but our brains edit stuff like that out. They don't, uh, you don't, when you're looking at this scene here and you're looking for your engine or you're looking at the scene, you don't see the upper deck. Your brain filters that stuff out. So it's a very legitimate thing to use Photoshop. 
elements or Photoshop or any other photo editing tool to uh, eliminate it and put a, a plain sky or even a fancy blue, uh, blue sky with clouds or whatever in the picture. This is that same scene as you'd see it as you walked into the railroad. This uh, main yard at Frankfurt, as I said, is a scale mile long. It's 43 inches off the floor, which is a nice working height. If you notice the roundhouse is truncated, that's a Lexan shield, not plexiglass. Plexiglass has a way of shattering. Um, Lexan is more expensive, but it's, it's not going to shatter on you. Um, I truncated it for several reasons. One of them is I want the uh, roundhouse foreman to be able to reach into the turntable or any stall in the roundhouse to be able to get a bulky engine or any other problem. Second, it gives you a view into the roundhouse so you get a chance to see what's going on in there and you can take the shield off to uh, take photographs inside the roundhouse or out onto the turntable. And then of course it gains uh, a lot of aisle space that you'd lose if that roundhouse was uh, fully modeled. The uh, dispatcher's office in Frankfurt was also the superintendent's office. I had the superintendent or the uh, dispatcher is inside the blob at the end of the peninsula. There's a lot of room. I have an actual dispatcher sheet uh, from that era uh, posted up in front of his desk so he can uh, look at it to see how the nickel plate recorded things. And I have copies, uh, scans, and then printouts by uh, staples of uh, actual dispatcher sheets that he can use or she can use to uh, uh, write down the train uh, information as the day goes on. The record book is where the train orders are dictated and copied. That's an exact uh, copy of the same book that the dispatchers used um, in 1950s. On the nickel plate, it's got a fancier cover, but it's otherwise identical. You can buy them at Staples. Um, the brick building that was in Frankfurt where the superintendent and the dispatchers worked, I'm going to kit bash it out of that Merchants Row 3 building. That's my next modeling project. Um, in Frankfurt was the eastbound yard office and westbound yard office. This is the eastbound yard office. This is where crews picked up their train orders that the dispatcher dictated to the operator here. Um, it's an important building, so it's worth scratch building. And today, scratch building is so simple with evergreen siding, uh, Tishy and Campbell, or uh, Grand Line now San Juan models, uh, moldings for doors and windows, and uh, pike stuff roof material. Uh, it's practically a one evening project with. Uh, 10X7R type cements and uh, polyscale paints that dry so quickly. You can scratch build a building like this with basic dimensions in a, in a single evening. So there's no reason not to. The uh, yard master's office on the westbound side was a concrete block and pike stuff makes interlocking block pieces. So you can knock this together pretty quick. But that little shanty on the left is a, a, a major industry in the yard at Frankfurt. You wouldn't think so, but if you notice leaning on the front of it is a blue sign, that's the car inspector shanty. And if you actually assign that job to somebody and have him look at the uh, cars as they come into the yard and look for low couplers, broken stirrup steps, missing brake wheels, stuff like that, um, the car inspector or car knocker, they call them, is going to find stuff wrong. And if he flags those with a bad, bad order ticket and makes the yard master cut those cars out of a train and set them over on the bad order track, one, it'll improve your rolling stock because I have to fix them between operating sessions or maybe even during the op session. But two, it creates an industry because that means the uh, rip track is a repair and place uh, track and it becomes an industry. So all those cars that are taken out of the train are shoved into rip track. It's an industry like a car is delivered to. And then the, after I fix them, the cars are picked up and put back in a train. So that little shanty there becomes a major 
car delivery uh, industry for the railroad. Downtown, uh, downtown Frankfurt, 1952, looked like this. A postman named Jim Osler took a lot of pictures, thank goodness. Um, I don't have any real data on that grain elevator, either one of them, but you can find Sanborn fire insurance maps. And uh, the, uh, they usually give you the footprint of buildings like that. And using photo editing software, you can uh, enlarge that building on the left, for example, if it says it was 30 feet by 40 feet, you can scale up that building so it's an HO scale 30 feet wide. And that will give you an approximation of the height. It won't be exactly right because of perspective issues. But from that, you can scratch build a pretty credible model of it. Uh, again, it's almost a one evening project because you've got to well, for example, Northeastern even makes that upper window that's halfway open that you can just glue in. You don't even have to screw around with the thing and then spray it with a uh, coat of a red primer. And then Pan Pastels makes these beautiful weathering powders that stick like glue. And uh, so you can uh, actually do the weathering on these things in seconds. Uh, with the pen pastel, so you don't have to get an airbrush out or anything else. So it makes modeling ridiculously simple, even scratch building. Um, and here's where the two buildings sit on the railroad. The gray building, I have no idea what the track side looked like, so I didn't scratch build it. I kid bashed it out of a Walters building. And uh, my head's kind of in the way. I'm going to see if I can get it out of the way. Um, you can see how that's a bookend for the upper middle deck scene there, uh, which cuts down into the lower deck at that point in time. Um, that was a tricky scene. Anytime you have a middle or upper deck scene that cuts down into a lower deck scene, that's a, a big problem. And it took me a year or two to figure out how to deal with how to blend the fascia and the valances together and then the lower deck scene is that grain elevator and it forms a bookend. And when you're working behind where my head is, you're not paying any attention to what's going on in the upper deck and where that Berkshire is going across that little Vermilion Bridge. When you're running that train, you're not paying attention to what's going on in the lower deck. The big uh, industry at Frankfurt is a Swift soybean plant. It's ADM today. And this was a pretty easy kit bash using a Walther's um, I think I use a cement plant and there's five tracks here. So one big industry is a much better deal than five small ones. Um, you have one track where you uh, clean out uh, uh, beans that didn't get dumped out of the box cars. You have a second track that unloads coal for the power plant and loads bean oil. You have two tracks that unload beans from uh, box cars back then today, covered hoppers. And you have a fifth track that loads uh, chicken feed and unloads hexane, uh, which is a solvent for the beans. So you get five different tracks worth of uh, action in one industry. And uh, it really keeps the crew busy the entire operating session. Now, if you're gonna have a soybean plant, you gotta have soybeans. I wasn't sure how to model soybeans. I tried some of the commercial products and they didn't work very well. But a guy named Jason Clocky, who works, he's a professional railroader. He's a young guy in Iowa. And uh, if you're in Iowa, like I was when I was a kid, you know all about farms. And, and uh, he found these great big bushy pipe cleaners. I always thought pipe cleaners were little thin white things but you can find online these big bushy brown pipe cleaners and he sprays them with thick hairspray like Rave and then dumps leaf flakes on them. And you make them in very, very neat orderly rows because back in the steam era, the uh, weeds had to be cultivated out, which means you take a tractor and a cultivator, which is like a plow with small heads on it and that means that the bean rows have to be far enough apart that you can drive a tractor down and a cultivator down. And uh, same thing when you planted them, you plant them with a corn drill, you plant the bean seeds. 
So you, again, they're planted in neat orderly rows. On the background, you can see corn. I'll talk about that in a second. Across the tracks, you can see wheat, which is just a mat that I got from uh, Scenic Express. The background on the, on the photograph we'll talk about in a little bit. That's uh, Scenic King from Canada. Bush makes plastic corn, um, works pretty well. Um, I also use JTT corn, which I'll back up. Uh, the corn in the distance there is JTT corn, individual stalks, uh, or you can get these rows of plastic corn. I sprayed this with an ochre color to show corn that's been fired, which is say matured. Uh, this is also JTT corn, a guy named Michael Shanahan had sent this picture out from New England. And I thought that was kind of a neat idea. It's a GHQ tractor and wagon. And uh, so I copied his idea. When you're using super trees, you got to pick out those curlicue weed like leaves. And if you crush them up and dump them in the field, it makes the leftover stuff pretty well. And uh, so I got the farmer there going along picking corn. The corn is just grass seed sprayed uh, an ochre color. Um, one of the things we worried about was when you're modeling granger country, you don't have a mountain to cut off the view of the distance. You've got, you know, miles and miles of distance. But by using photographic backdrops, you can pretend uh, you're modeling miles of view, like that distant grain elevator there is like five miles away. And yet this is only 16 inches deep. Uh, from the fascia in the foreground to where the photo backdrop begins. But even that's kind of excessive. Bill Darnaby is using eight inches or 10 inches of width. And he's concluded that only eight inches is probably plenty deep. Uh, and the advantages of this are that by making it eight inches instead of 16 inches deep, you gain not only eight inches of aisle width, but probably 16 inches of aisle width because it's eight inches on both sides of the aisle. And you've saved eight inches of scenery, eight inches of time. And I don't see anything in this picture that Bill is losing by not making his bench work as wide as mine is. So narrow bench work between towns, not in towns, but between towns, it looks like an increasingly good idea. Now, Photoshop is also a handy thing, or Photoshop Elements, which is much easier. Um, I took the photo that's behind my head uh, back in the 70s, early 70s, and I needed a backdrop that had the highway bridge in it, but I didn't need the railroad bridge. Well, using Photoshop, you can use the clone tool or rubber stamp tool and you can paint out that railroad bridge by just cloning the sky and cloning the, the clouds. Very simple to do. You can do it in probably two minutes. You could wipe that railroad bridge out. Same thing where it goes in the trees. Just copy the trees over where the bridge is and the bridge just magically disappears. So now you have a picture with the clouds and sky and the trees and the one and a half railroad bridges, but you need four railroad bridges. So you copy the total whole railroad bridge uh, three more times. So you have all four spans of the railroad bridge, but they all look alike. So then you tediously get in between the members of the bridge and change the way the trees look. And you also copy the river to make it four times as wide. And when you do that, you get the picture at the top uh, as a background. Now, the second problem you're gonna run into is that the river, when you look down at it, um, is green. It's a, a pea soup green color. It's not pretty blue at all, like you look at it in the distance from the clouds and the sky reflecting. And I didn't know how to change the blue and transition it into the green, but it hit me finally one day that where the shadow of the bridge is, I could go from the blue to a blue gray to a gray to the green right under the bridge. And it doesn't jar your eye so bad 
by making the transition right there. Sini King uh, in Canada, Les Maver is the guy's name, makes these uh, eight and a half by 16 sheets that you cut and glue to the wall. I cut the sky off of them because my sky is a lot higher than the eight and a half inches he gives you. And when you do that, cut down into the trees. Don't try to cut right at the tree line because if you do, you'll show a little bit of blue sky and it'll look awful. Uh, and when you do that, you can change the shape of the tree so you can reuse it. And if you notice, just above the middle of the bridge, there's a red brick house back there. And if you reuse the same scene, just section out that bri brick uh, house so that you don't notice it uh, reappearing every three feet or whatever. He also now makes uh, five foot long scenes so you don't have to glue them together like this. Here's some of his backdrops. And again, uh, by cutting the sky off and changing the shapes of the trees, what you just do is you cut the sky off. You can reuse the same soybean or wheat or cornfield again and again and again, uh, because the trees won't look the same uh, because you reshape them. The all important interchanges, this is the main reason to model the Midwest. The Midwest, if you look at a map, the railroads look like a fishnet because they're north-south railroads going between the lakes and the uh, Gulf and the east-west railroads. And uh, here you got the nickel plate, St. Louis line crossing the Chicago and Eastern Illinois in my hometown of Cayuga. Now, you notice there's two concentric tracks there, the steam engines on one and a boxcar being switched by Jeeps on the other one. The grain elevator switched by the Jeep maybe gets two or three or four loads a day out of there. That's all you get out of that track. The other track right next to it that's not served by an industry is an interchange track. And that could get you know, maybe 50, 60 cars a day in and out of that track, because every time the nickel plate delivers or pick up, the CNEI could deliver or pick up. So an interchange track is a really, really busy industry, and it doesn't even require that you build any kind of a structure. So interchanges are hugely important, and that's what modeling the flatlands of the Midwest is all about. Now, right just to the left of that picture I just showed you is this tower. Um, the, uh, I showed you this same tower on, on an earlier picture. The guy coming down the stairs is the uh, Bill Schwab, the operator there. And his daughter uh, found this photo and made sure I got a copy of it. I kit bashed the tower out of a Walters kit, uh, scratch built the depot. Um, Poly lumber is just a styrene box with Campbell's uh, siding stuck on the side of it. Uh, you don't want it to be too neat because if you look at the structure, it's not too neat either. Very easy scratch building. My dad and I and my son Dave went out uh, in the fall of 1957 uh, and, and uh, 67 and finally found this bridge. And my big old head is, let's see if I can get out of the way. My big old head is in the way of this picture I took that day of dad and Dave and I um, looking at this bridge. I never did see a train go over it, but thanks to scale model railroading, uh, I did get a chance to uh, see a train go over it on my model railroad. That same day I crawled up to the top of the bridge and took a picture of the backdrop and that's what the backdrop is in the photograph. Now just west of that bridge, was the town of Humerick, which was hardly a town at all, just a few houses. By the time I'm modeling, the depot was gone, the grain elevators were gone. There was nothing left but this interchange in the middle of a field. Now, if you went there today, you'd never even know there was two railroads across there. They were gone. But the Milwaukee Road and the Nickel Plate in 1953 interchanged 12,000 loads a year. Uh, that was 60 car loads a day interchange there. Now you find a Midwestern industry or even a Northeastern industry that does 60 carloads a day. I mean, man, that's like an automobile plant. So, you know, this is why interchanges are so important. 
Now, the way I modeled it is this. Uh, the bench works only 16 inches wide, so the Milwaukee Road is just a stub with a nickel plate. But in the top photograph there, that boxcar on the left is where the nickel plate delivers cars to the Milwaukee Road. And that track that the boxcar is on will take up to 30 cars. So that's the 30 cars to the Milwaukee Road a day. Now the caboose is butted up against a low backdrop. If you look carefully, you can see a shadow along just above the caboose that's running along there. Behind that shadow backdrop is a track. And on that track are a pair of Milwaukee Road sea liners and um, up to 30 or so freight cars. And to the far left of that picture, if you keep going down to the left, you'll come to the bottom picture, which is a bunch of trees. And behind that backdrop, the cars emerge and that hopper car is sitting on top of a infrared cell. And as long as that hopper car is sitting on top of that cell, nothing happens. The nickel plate comes into Humeric and sees that, that hopper car and it couples on and takes the cars, but it only gets eight cars because there's a pin in the eighth car and it picks up those cars and takes off. That uncovers the photo cell or the IR cell and sets off a timer. And a half hour or so later, a timer clicks in a relay and those sea liners fire up and they start shoving at a few scale miles an hour and pretty soon another cut of cars come out there and they shove out until they cover that photo cell. And that happens four times a day because there were four Milwaukee Road freights on this line a day. So that's how Iowa scaled energy, Iowa scaled engineering's automated interchange. Really works slick. I use it here and also at Linden. The next town along the line as we work west is Metcalf, Illinois. Uh, nickel plate's not uh, through here anymore, or even the Norfolk and Western or Norfolk Southern, but the Eastern Illinois short line runs there, and CSX runs the B&O line that used to go through here. The grain elevator that was served by the B&O is still there, but it's not rail served anymore. Um, I model it uh, as it probably looked in the 1950s. Uh, the top picture shows it when I had a pair of depots, but now there's a, right behind my shoulder is a joint depot that Randy Loft from Boys from Vermont built for me, uh, replaced those two joint depots. I originally had a bunch of Rick's uh, grain silos there to the left of the grain elevator, and now they've been replaced with uh, um, resin car works castings that are much, much more accurate. Uh, there's also another company that's got some green elevators, uh, or green silos on the market. Um, this is Metcalf, Illinois, and it's, it's an approximation of what it looked like because I don't really have good data on it from the 50s, but as I get more information, I, I upgrade it. Um, as I said, Randy Scratch built this uh, depot for me, and uh, we went to the National Archives Annex, Perry Square and I did, and we found this drawing in the archives annex, and then we found this photo in a local history. So if you keep scratching, you start coming up with stuff. In the local history was this picture of the grain elevator served by the nickel plate, but this is not the track side. So I had to just take a wild guess as to what the track side looked like. And uh, I wasn't about to scratch build it from that wild guess. So I just get back three Walters grain elevators into something that resembled it. Um, Metcalf is there on the top, the red arrow on the right, on the left. And below it is the red arrow is Linden. These are vertically paired towns. When you have a multi-deck railroad, it's, it's smart to offset the working areas of the two towns that are on the same uh, side of the aisle. So if you're working in Metcalf on the upper deck, you're working at the left or west end of town. And if you're working at Linden, uh, that town has most of the activity at the east end or, or right end of town. So if you, you know, if you're careful in picking your towns, you can 
usually offset your work areas and not have crews running into each other. Next town along the line as we work our way west is Oakland, Illinois. Uh, the depot, Nickel Plate Depot still exists, but it's somebody's house and I knocked on the door and, and the woman answered and I asked her, I said, I see your home's covered with aluminum siding and I can't really tell how it looked and would it be okay if I kind of jimmied some of the siding off, get a better look. And that's when I met her dog, a German Shepherd named Blitzkrieg. Um, so I still don't know what that depot looked like, but then somebody sent me a photograph so now I know what the track side looked like. And uh, I'm sure all of you sleep with the Walther's catalog under your pillow at night. And if you do that, things by osmosis start creeping in your brain. And if you look at the trim up in the eaves of this depot, it'll start looking familiar. And it looks like a Woodland Scenics um, former DPM kit. So I kit bashed a Woodland Scenics depot into something that resembles the uh, Oakland Depot. It's shorter, um, but too bad because it, this is a side that faces the tracks anyway and nobody can even see it. I have no idea what the side that faces the aisle that everybody can see looks like. Uh, fortunately, it's in shadow anyway. But if I get better data, then I'll scratch build or, or do a better job kit bashing. Um, Sometimes uh, it's smarter to not even do something. Uh, Grand Line used to have this beautiful Midwestern Petroleum Deep uh, Oil Distributors Kit. And uh, I understand that San Juan has recently re released it, but it's like 50 or 60 bucks. And you need, usually you need about two or three kits to do anything. Um, I found this photo on the internet and uh, instead of using it as a pattern to model one of the uh, oil dealers in, in uh, Oakland, I just simply photoshopped the photo and glued it to the wall. And uh, that was the end of that. But it is a wonderful kit if you do need an oil distributor. Tom Johnson, who moved from Indiana to Florida recently, is a master artist who used to teach art and the upper left photograph showed how uh, uncreatively his road ended at a wall originally. And then Jim Six taught him about digital photography. So Tom said, hmm. So the upper right photograph shows it after Tom glued a digital photograph to the wall. But you can see the street does not match the photograph. Uh, Johnson rule number one, do not retouch the photograph, retouch the 3D road. So the lower left-hand photograph shows how Tom repainted the actual road to match the photograph. Now he's an artist and he can do that easily, but that's the way to do it, is retouch the 3D scenery, not the photo. Uh, if you stand off to one side, uh, you get a curve in the foot in the road, but it, you know, it, it still looks okay. Uh, when you're taking those photographs for the backdrop, don't compensate for an angle. In other words, if you know the road's going to hit the backdrop at a 45 degree angle, don't try to compensate. Just stand in the middle of the road, have somebody watch behind you, of course. And uh, no matter what angle you look at it, it's going to look okay. Um, here's a photograph I took straight down that road, glued it to the wall, and then after all the scenery's in place, even though it was taken uh, straight down the road, it still looks okay in the, in the backdrop. Creative Tom uh, also noticed that sill floor makes a leaf material. You're supposed to stretch it out and just use it as ground cover. But Tom said, no, nah, I don't think so. Uh, he decided to rub off the leaves that are embedded in the material. You can get this from Scenic Express. And then he poured the leaves down on the roof and down in the gutter of the road and stuff. Absolutely stunning effect. Um, 
this is a good example of use your head, which I didn't do uh, on Fairgrange, Illinois, the next to last town on my railroad. Um, at Fairgrange, um, nice sunny day. I took a picture of the track side of the grain elevator that was there. Hooray for me back in the film days. But I didn't go around and shoot the shady side by opening up several f-stops. Today with a digital camera, you could easily do that. But of course, guess which side shows from the aisle, the shady side. So I have no idea what it looked like and, and it was too stupid to do that. Um, I will go back and add all, a lot of those details and stuff, but it just is a good lesson and uh, take lots of pictures. The last town on the line is Charleston, Illinois. Again, sleeping with the Walther's catalog under your pillow. Um, the depot at Charleston looks a lot like uh, one of the uh, kits at Walther sells, Pella Depot. And uh, so I kid bashed it into Pella. Um, I probably should have moved the, the uh, baggage door to the other end. Uh, I was actually using a build-up model that was hard to do that in, but uh, I should have gotten a, a real kit and moved it around, but I put a new dormer on it and it, it gets pretty close. It's got the right spirit. Um, Walther's also makes, I think, Water Street term, Freight House or something like that. And I got rid of the big head house, but I used the uh, other piece of it to model the freight house and use the uh, classic City Classics uh, uh, awnings over the windows to model the freight house. So uh, got pretty close without a lot of work. Um, I'm not a big Facebook user, but somebody told me there was a Cloverleaf group on Facebook. And I go, yeah, yeah, waste of my time. And the first day I got on Facebook, here was this picture that I instantly recognized as a, a building I've been trying to track down for years, the Maple Hotel in Charleston, which was right next to the depot. And you can see the baggage carts in the upper left-hand photo. Um, and again, if you look at that picture and you've been paying attention to Walter's catalog, you recognize it as a uh, Pike stuff or DPM or one of those uh, typical kits that you can get. So by just a little bit of kit bashing, I was able to come up with a building that was pretty doggone close to it without much effort at all. Um, don't overlook some of the foreign kits that you'd normally just write off. Um, Kibri has a kit that was cheaper if you bought it from Model Power and it looked like that uh, Charleston Yard office at the lower left. That always looked to me like kind of like a German building anyway. And uh, it's four windows instead of five, so I sectioned out a window. I whacked off the entire top story, build a new roof for it, build a, um, the ladder or staircase up to the second story, uh, and uh, use the concrete block building from using that, the pike stuff, uh, concrete block stuff. So again, by getting rid of all the filigree and some other stuff like that, it was a pretty accurate model that came out of the uh, a foreign building that you normally not pay any attention to. Uh, when you get to Charleston, you're 68 and a half inches high uh, off the floor. Um, so uh, my yard master and my roundhouse foreman there uh, duck under by using railings to support their arms and back. Um, and they work up on an eight inch platform and then there's another eight inch step that they can get. And that makes it a very comfortable place to work up there. Um, and at the other end of Charleston, there's a big, that's a four bay sheet of plywood with a notch cut out of it. So they can work there. The two red arrows show the staging yards. This is an early photograph. Uh, the railroad at this end is essentially complete now. But that shows where you start and where you end your run going east or westbound. Uh, so it's twice around the room. You start at 43 inches, you end up at 68 and a half inches. The railroad is a timetable and trend order operator, operation. This is the Charleston's uh, yard uh, operator's desk. 
there's an operator at Frankfurt, there's an operator here at Charleston, there's a dispatcher. Uh, they, they take uh, dict dictated uh, train orders from, from the dispatcher. Uh, I'm installing a new telephone system, so it'll be very realistic using actual nickel plate and telephones. Um, a lot of fun. It's not that hard to, to learn. We thought it might be, but uh, after a couple sessions, everybody's up on the speed. Uh, Don Daly is a uh, late Don Daly, unfortunately, um, is a professional nickel plate railroader. Uh, was last farming to break in on steam out of Frankfurt. And uh, fortunately, he got to come out and run the railroad that he helped me uh, design and, and uh, gave me a lot of the data to make it uh, very authentic. So without him, it would have been a facsimile of what it should have been. And uh, this picture shows that uh, the time machine actually works. I was able to uh, build a, a, a model that let me go back in time. So um, uh, I'm delighted with the effort. It uh, started around 2000, year 2000. Here we are uh, 11, what, years later? 20, uh, 21 years later. And uh, I, I'm, I, th I think it was worth the effort. Now I'm all set for questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is Bernie Rod. Uh, what's the what's the total size of this layout? Um, it's an odd shape, but it's about sixty feet long and about twenty five to thirty feet wide, depending on where you measure. So, so how many people actually worked on this? Well, just just me, except. Uh, hmm. uh, just before we had our first operating session, three or four friends came over and helped me do some last minute wiring and, and uh, track laying in a hidden staging yard to get it ready. But uh, I'm pretty much a lone wolf uh, because I never know when I'm going to have time to work on the railroad. No, you did an incredible job. Beautiful. Thank you. I've got a question. I'm Nick Callis. I noticed the garage. So is it sort of like a walkout basement? The garage is at the basement level? Yeah. Yeah, The uh, if you look carefully at the track plan, um, one of the clever things that Frank Odina did when he designed it, my, my plan was not very good, and Frank Odina said, let me do it. And he took the back nine feet of the garage and we built a fireproof knee wall that sits over the hood of the, the car, which means my wife SUV won't fit in it. Um, and uh, so the, uh, um, there, there's only, it's, it's like about nine feet wide, but it's 13 feet deep which means with a curve, it's about 15 feet out and 15 feet back on two decks. Well, that's 60 feet of railroad, which is a mile. So one mile of the railroad is out in that garage uh, or former garage, which is one eighth of the entire railroad is out there. So that was a pretty clever design feature that Frank came up with. Did you have, did you have windows to contend with in, in there? that you covered up or? Yeah, there's uh, three windows and I just uh, painted them black and covered them on the inside and covered them over with masonite. Probably broke 10 fire codes, that's the way it goes. Hey, Tony. Yep. This, this is Bill Leiters. Uh, I noticed most of your scenes are all based on photographs either that you found or that you took. Did you spend a lot of time traveling out there to do that or were you able to do it all on the internet? 
No, no, no internet um, to speak of, uh, unless they're very old photos. Uh, I grew up in some of these towns and, and uh, I probably made a half dozen field trips out there um, after I decided, I mean, I'd already gathered a lot of data when I lived out there and I founded the Nickel Plate Society back in 1966. So I've been gathering data ever since anyway. And uh, the Nickel Plate Society's got some information, but not a whole lot on this line. Um, but uh, Perry Squire and Bill Darnaby and I, and Don Daly to some extent, made what we called third sub safaris uh, out there on a number of occasions. You did an amazing job. Thank you. Tony, there's a question in the chat from Bill, and I'm really going to try to pronounce his last name because I'm probably going to blow it. But he's uh, asking, uh, what are your favorite parts of the hobby, and do you have any moments where you miss the Allegheny Midland? Well, let me answer, answer the last part first. Uh, the, um, I think if we'd have had good DCC sound, um, the Allegheny Midland might have lasted longer. Uh, the uh, lack of diesel sound, we had pretty decent steam sound with Dynatrol. Uh, no whistle, but the steam sound was, exhaust was pretty good, but no diesel. And uh, if we could have had good diesel sound, good, just like we have today, if we had that whole panoply of sounds, um, that might have saved the day. Uh, and uh, I still love Appalachian Coal Railroading. Um, so it's, it's really hard to say. Uh, the, uh, but I had 25 years of the Allegheny Midland. So, you know, it's not like it wasn't fully amortized. Um, favorite parts of the railroad or of, of the hobby, uh, other than the friendships, which which probably rank number one. I mean, I've almost literally traveled around the world several times with the friends I made. Uh, uh, New Zealand once and Australia a couple times and Antarctica once and, you know, whole, Europe several times, and always with model railroaders. Um, and I don't think we'd have done any of those trips if it hadn't have been for the, you know, the connections that we had that got us all fired up about, let's go do this. Um, but uh, I, th I th somehow, there's just some some kind of an undefinable magic about scale models that uh, seeing this thing come back to life. I mean, people people are always amazed that that uh, Alan McClellan and, and I don't run our model railroads much. You know, we don't run them between sessions uh, just to run them. And unless we're short of crews, we don't run them during the session. Uh, and they don't, they have a tough time understanding that. But uh, if I could explain that in, in, in concise terms, I'd, I'd uh, be a better writer and orator, but uh, so it's somewhere in there that uh, I, I think the picture that you, I think you can see on the screen is a pretty good summary of of the whole thing to be able to create a scene that I didn't get to see personally and to be able to now see it to a high degree of authenticity, even though it's it's not a real accurate scale model. I mean, I'm, I'm using um, microengineering Central Valley bridge parts to make it convenient to build. Um, 
but yet the abutment is a very unusual abutment that we went out there and measured and I scratch built. So, you know, it's not just a grab a wall, there's abutment and call it a day. You know, it's an honest effort. Um, I don't know. Somewhere the answer is in there. Well, very good. Uh, Ken Nesper is asking uh, what the size of a typical operating session is on your layout and the number of operators and the length of the session. Sessions are four hours long um, at three to one. So we operate half a day, uh, either midnight to noon or noon to midnight. And uh, it takes... Oh, uh, we might squeeze by with 13 or 14 guys and gals. Um, we could probably accommodate up to like 20 or so. Um, but uh, it gets, it starts getting pretty crowded and, and you get people standing around. The Allegheny Midland had a crew lounge and uh, this railroad ate up all that space. Um, because I discovered the crew lounge, I made it too comfortable. I had a table with period specific magazines and I had uh, Bill Miller uh, record a radio program uh, from WWVA with period, you know, commercials and all that kind of stuff. And it, it got to be so, it was so nice and comfy out there that getting a crew back in there to go to work was a little difficult. So I thought, no, we're not doing that again. Um, so in, on this railroad, you're, you're either working or, or you're probably in somebody's way. So the fewer, we've discovered the, the 14, 15, 16 people sessions are, usually a lot better than the 20 session people, people sessions. Okay, uh, Brad Stafford's asking the question about, uh, have you ever been tempted to add a non-actual scene where it doesn't ruin the accuracy, but it's a fun thing to insert like a kids in a stream or a, a new waterfall, something like that? Well, the, f the farm scene that I showed right at the start is not an actual scene. Um, Bill Darnaby and I drove between Frankfurt and Linden to try to find a real farm scene to model. And we actually found a, a barn that I copied uh, way over in Petersburg, which is anywhere near that. Um, but at, at some point, I just gave up and said, oh, I'll, I'll just make a, a farm out of it because I grew up on and around farms. And uh, I'm sure any good farmer would tear me right down. Uh, but, uh, you know, if uh, I would, the, the short answer to that is no, um, because I'm not a, a scenery wonk. Um, I had that on the Allegheny Midland. I had my chance to do that for, like I said, a quarter of a century to about anything that was neat that I wanted to do, I could do and did. Uh, but there were always actual scenes that were appropriate to West Virginia, uh, like a building with a porch that overhung a stream in the back and stuff like that. But uh, on this one, I, I kind of learned a hard lesson on the Midland that the more I deviated from the prototype, the less satisfied I was with it. So I'm, I'm pretty careful to not screw around with this one uh, for fear that it'll start wandering down a path that I don't want to go. Okay, Max Munger is asking uh, how long uh, to restage your trains, locos, et cetera, between sessions, and how do the engines get turned around? Um, the engines get, steam engines get turned around by picking them up, and, and uh, that's borderline dangerous, but uh, there's, there's really no easy way to do it. There's a, 
cradle that uh, Pico makes that you can back them into it and turn them around, but um, it's probably more hassle than it's worth. So I just learned how to pick up a steam engine, turn it around and put it back on the tracks. It's not ideal, but the last thing in the world I want is a reversing loop because they, uh, they take up huge amounts of space. Um, and there's no way to connect the two ends of the railroad. I mean, there's that would be a huge design compromise to make something like that work. I have a, just give me a chance for a plug. I've got a new book coming out. I did a book on multi-deck model railroads and I, Kalmbach asked me to do an all new book. So I didn't even look at the old book. Um, and uh, the, the idea is that the first book was kind of overhanging the market. We didn't really understand them well. Uh, we just knew that it was an exciting new idea. This one is, you know, the, the idea of multi decks has matured. So I've got people saying what's right and what's wrong with them, including on mine. Um, so we talk about stuff like that. Um, but, uh, that's, I, in fact, I don't think I even mentioned that picking up steam engines and turning them around. As far as staging goes, I did talk about that. Um, but because my railroad's a muzzle loading, uh, staging operation, just like the Midland, uh, I don't have to back every train out because I don't need every train to be staged because um, we're operating half a day. But uh, I back it out of staging and as the caboose shows up, I take the caboose off and set it on the bench work and back the train out until the engine shows up. And I pick the engine up and do a 180 and put it on the bench work. And then I flip the way bells and uh, if there's some really weird car in the consist, like a, um, you know, a transformer or something like that, that I think has shown up too much, I'll just take that car off the railroad for a while. But I'll cycle the cars, cycle the oil bills, and uh, put the caboose at the end of that cut of cars and back the train into whatever the staging, I have a diagram that shows what trains go on what tracks and back the train into its appropriate staging track and then re-rail the locomotive and uh, back it on in under its own power and it's staged. So that takes maybe five minutes and there's uh, 17 staging tracks at the east end, 12 at the west end, and six at the Peoria division. But uh, let's say half of those have to be restaged. So it's it's a long, long afternoon at best. So let's say it, you know, I probably would spend part of one afternoon on two days restaging the railroad. Well, thank you, Tony. Does anybody else have any other questions? That's all I have on the chat. Oh. Todd Herman saying, any temptation to reset the time machine to a different year for select sessions, such as the 1960 diesels there in the uh, in QB days? Yeah, uh, I've been gathering uh, power for a 1965 session. I, uh, when I had a car and got over to Frankfurt all the time was in the 60s. And uh, if I moved the session up to 65, that would be just after the N&W merger. So that would let me run Wabash Fs and U25Bs and maybe an N&W GP30 which is a really ugly looking engine, but it's cool. And uh, I have some of that equipment, uh, freight cars left over from the Allegheny Midland. So uh, I've been gathering that. I've got uh, quite, a, quite a few locomotives, but a lot of them aren't uh, decoder equipped yet. So it's a major expense, but uh, we'll see. I'm not getting younger. Um, 
but it's a it's a real possibility. Uh, but I just bought another steam engine, and <laughs> so so I'm not uh, I'm not rushing in that direction. Well, very good, Tony. That's all the questions that like I said I have on the chat. Does anybody else have anything else? If uh, if not, uh, Tony, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to be with us this afternoon and talk to us about your railroad. It's uh, it's really great to uh, to see what you've done. And just want to say also that I know you've been an inspiration to many of us over the years that have been a model railroading in terms of the various articles and all that you have. Uh, written and the information you provided to us to allow us to gain some of the knowledge you have. Well, it's an honor to be asked to give a talk and I, uh, I really appreciate you working at me through the technical issues. <laughs> it's, that's easy. <laughs> Not I, a problem. Like Bill. Uh, Tony, I want to thank you again for doing this for us. You're welcome. And, uh,